Japan, the land of the rising sun. Known for a lot of things nowadays, but one thing I interest myself in is not anime, but Japanese tanks. Okay, and also a little bit of anime. But regardless of that, Japanese armor never fails to intrigue me. There's always a lot of very mysterious stuff that we don't know about. Even with the more famous vehicles, it always surprises me how much information we end up not knowing. But today's vehicle will be a bit more well known. It will be one a lot of you might be familiar with. The one and only Type 95 Ago. So, the first thing to note is that the Type 95 was one of Japan's first ever tank projects that they produced all by themselves. Prior to this, Japan had some Reynolds FTs and NCs, but they also had some British armored vehicles such as the Vickers 6 ton and Vickers Medium Mark C. These tanks would inspire Japanese engineers and would lead to the creation of the Type 89 Aigo, the first tank produced by Japan. However, the Type 89 had some problems, the most important one being the rather poor mobility of only 25 km per hour, which resulted in the tank being unable to work in a Japanese mechanized corps, which was as fast as 40 km per hour. The Type 89 was an infantry tank and was therefore never designed to work in the cavalry. Despite the lack of concern from the Japanese Army High Command, work would start on a new vehicle in 1933. A vehicle capable of working at high speeds with maneuverability as the number one priority. The tank was heavily inspired by the Type 92 tankette. This was the first indigenous tankette designed by Japan. Being designed in 1931, it had the capability of reaching speeds up to 40 km per hour. Precisely what the Japanese engineers wanted on the new tank. And after some more discussing, the initial design work on the tank began in mid-1933. Between June and August of 1934, the first prototype was completed. Tests with the vehicle were largely positive. However, the Japanese were still not fully satisfied with the weight of 7.5 tons. Therefore, the tank received some alterations, which reduced the weight to 6.5 tons. What the so-called alterations were are unclear, but it's likely that armor was reduced and the amount of ammunition carried by that thing was also decreased. Furthermore, some changes to the suspension were made. After these alterations, the tank underwent a retrial. It broke its previous speed record of 43 km per hour by 2 km and had an operational range of 370 km now instead of the previous 250. It could cross trenches that were up to 2 meters wide. This was not the end of the trials. The improved prototype was sent over to the Calvary School for practical tests in October 1934. The Calvary reviewed it as a perfect tank for their demands, but the infantry was less happy. They were concerned about the light armament and thin armor protection of the vehicle. These disagreements between the two led to another period of testing. These tests took place between late 1934 and early 1935. The tests took place in northern Manchuria. The tests showed that the vehicle was ready for duty. It had proven itself worthy in the cold conditions of the rough terrain. This resulted in the Type 92 and the Type 94 being replaced by the new and superior Type 95 Ago. Or was there more? As with a lot of other vehicles, there seems to be a little bit of a name debate going on. Different sources assign different designations to the vehicle. The most well-known one is the Kyogo Sikike Sencha Ago, or in other words, Type 95 Ago. The 95 is in reference to the year it was built in, the Japanese Imperial Year 2595. The equivalent year of this is the year 1935. Ago means third model, but some sources state the name Kego, which translates to third light vehicle. Other sources seem to refer to the vehicle as Kyogo, which translates to 95. After successful trials, the vehicle would finally enter production. Just kidding, a second prototype was ordered for further testing. A second prototype was constructed in either June 1934 or 35 and finished that November. The second prototype changed drastically. One of these changes was done to the all sides. They were now rounded out instead of fully flat. This was a big plus point for the crew as it was now a whole lot more easier to operate. In addition, the infantry was still complaining about the weak firepower, so it was decided to mount a secondary 6.5mm machine gun to the turret. With some more modifications, the production model of the Ago reached a weight of 7.4 tons. After the success of the second prototype, production was authorized. The first one to produce the vehicle was Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. This began in 1936. Production initially began slowly, with only 31 vehicles being completed in the year 1936. But over time, more companies joined in, which resulted in mass production really kicking off in 1938. The total amount of vehicles produced varies wildly from source to source. Numbers range from 1100 all the way up to 2375 and in between. 
keep in mind that these numbers are from 1938 up to 1943. But it's also unclear when production of the Hago ended. It is stated that the production continued all the way up to the war's end in 1945. Both riveted and welded construction was used on the vehicle. Now let's talk business. The Hago used a compact one-man turret. It housed a main gun, the 37mm Type 94. This gun could penetrate 35mm of armor at 300 meters using armor piercing rounds. It also had the capability to fire high explosive rounds. However, due to the small caliber, these had only light effect. This gun was actually a slightly modified version of an infantry anti-tank gun. Later production models are said to be equipped with a improved 37mm Type 97 as well as some with 47mm guns. However, no photographic evidence of any of these vehicles are currently known to exist. Secondary armaments are the two machine guns, one in the hull and the other in a rather unusual turret mount. These were the Type 91 6.5mm machine guns, which were modified versions of the Type 11. Later models used the Type 97 7.7mm heavy tank machine gun, which was a Japanese copy of the Czech CBVZ26. Both machine guns mounted on the tank had telescopic sights and coming back to the machine gun in the rear of the turret, this was done to allow the Hako to be used in infantry support. This came with the downside that the Hako could not use both weapons on the same target. But this was somewhat compensated by the fact that one of the machine guns could be mounted on the turret roof. The turret had a commander's cupola with several vision slits and a two-piece hatch on top. However, the Hako was never destined to be the strongest, but rather the most mobile. It was powered by a 120 horsepower Mitsubishi 6 cylinder diesel engine. The power to weight ratio was 16 horsepower per ton and it could reach speeds up to 48 km per hour. Fuel capacity was 84 liters, with the average operational range being around 250 km. Japanese engineers used diesel engines over petrol engines. Reportedly, when the army was testing British Vickers Mark E tanks, one of the petrol powered tanks caught fire. The fire took out the tank along with the entire crew. The engine was installed in the rear of the vehicle. On the right side, the exhaust protruded from the engine bay and it was fixed to the right rear fender. The transmission was located at the front, which was a sliding gear system. Alongside that were the brakes and the final drives, as well as the drive wheels. The suspension of the Hago is also pretty interesting. It utilized a bell crank suspension, one designed by Tommy Ohara. This man was one of the best Japanese tank designers, with his suspension being used on a lot of other Japanese vehicles as well. The Hago used two bogies with two road routes on each side. This type of suspension had both pros and cons. For pros, it is easy to maintain and produce. Moreover, it doesn't take up any space inside of the vehicle, unlike for example the torsion bars or Christie suspension. On the other hand, the bogies had a lot of room to move, which resulted in a not so smooth ride for whenever the vehicle was moving on uneven terrain. The tracks were all metal and it had two return rollers. The idler wheel was held in place by a single bracket. Being a light tank, you can imagine that this tank didn't feature much bulk. Armor thickness ranged from 6 to 12 mm. Much of the armor was sloped at various angles. To improve survivability, some Hagos were equipped with turret mounted smoke dischargers. The tank was operated by a crew of three men, Japanese sized. A driver on the front right, a hull gunner on the front left, and a commander in the turret, who also worked the gun. The driver had his own hatch, while the hull gunner next to him would have to enter and escape via the turret. The commander had one hell of a time as he had three different jobs to do all at once. He had to be in charge to command the tank and its crew, all while acting as the loader for the 37mm and the rear mounted machine gun in the turret. As if that wasn't challenging enough, he also had the honor of manually aiming the gun. For this, he had to hold the weapon like a giant rifle with his right hand on the grip and trigger and his shoulder pressed against a shoulder brace which would then act as a sort of stock which also provided a tiny bit of stabilization. To top it off, the commander had no internal radio to communicate with the crew, he had a speaking tube that led to the driver and bow gunner. Unless it was a command vehicle, most Japanese tanks rarely used radios for outside communication, mainly relying on signal flags. An interesting thing used for communication was this fake bolt on the outside. Infantry troops could press this, sort of like a button, and it would act as a buzzer to grab the commander's attention. Now we get to the rise and fall of the Hago. The first time the Hago was used in action was in China. They were used in mixed mechanized brigades which combined infantry, artillery and tank regiments. However, inadequate performance led to the disbandment of the brigade. The Hago seemed to have served in China up to the war's end, but most were moved to the Pacific front. 
The first real battle it saw was the Battle of Kaklingo. It fought against Soviet armored cars and tanks, mainly BT tanks. The Type 95 was paired with Type 89s and Type 94s. Together with the infantry, they managed to break through the Soviet defense line. However, counterattacks by the Soviets led to heavy Japanese losses. With reportedly 42 out of the 73 tanks being lost. But regardless of that, the Type 95 still performed well, as it could take out any other Soviet vehicle it would have faced. Now we enter the 1940s. Here is where we reach the end of the peak performance of the Hago. Previously, the Hako was fighting mainly in places which had no armored forces or lightweight vehicles similar to it. Western vehicles such as the M3 and M4 pulverated Hakos. That's not to say Hakos were entirely useless though. The mobility of the Japanese vehicles proved incredibly useful. During the conquest of Malaya in 1941, the Hago tanks, alongside the new Chiha, made good progress even on the harsh terrain. Alongside the infantry, the tanks were quite effective, with their speed causing havoc amongst Indian defenders. The Type 95 mainly used its mobility as its gun was too weak to deal with heavy fortifications. Thanks to the absence of allied armor, the Hako performed well during the conquest. The Hako would also see success in the Philippines. It would fight against the American M3 tanks. While the Hako was less effective against the M3, Japanese still made good use of combined arms and outnumbered the American forces. It will also see limited use in the conquest of the Dutch East Indies, mainly for infantry fire support roles. It achieved even more success in Burma. The Hako proved itself once again, but many were lost due to the harsh terrain and lack of spare parts. This was one of the last large successes the Hako would see. We now arrive at the fall of the Hako. It's 1943 now and the Americans can field the M4 Sherman. The Hako had long since become obsolete at this point. It was no match for the M4 Sherman. It had armor up to 90mm thick while having a powerful 75mm gun to match it. In many cases, the Hako tanks fought admirably but just simply couldn't deal significant damage to their enemies. Armor piercing rounds fired by the M4 passed straight through the little thing while high explosive shells were extremely lethal. Many Hakos were lost trying to fight opponents that were pretty much superior in every way. As the end of the war got closer, Hakos had to be used for defense. Many were turned into static bunkers. The tank, which played such a crucial role for early Japanese success, had now reached its end and had fallen by the might of the M4 Sherman. It had many weaknesses as shown by a very cool analysis made by the American army. Its poor armor and armament being a thing which was common on a lot of Japanese armored vehicles. Now, the Hako had many variants. To speed through some, the Type 2 Kami was an amphibious tank built on a modified version of the Type 95 chassis. It was a good design, but less than 200 would be produced. The Type 3 Keri was one of the many attempts at increasing the firepower. Sources vary on the armament it would have used, it's either the 75mm Type 90 gun or a different 37 or 47mm. This gun would have had the capability to fire heat shells. The Type 4 Kenu was another one of those attempts. This time it used a turret from the Chiha. This turret used a 57mm gun. Production was limited and it's unknown how many were produced. These things saw action against Soviet forces near the end of the war. Lastly, there were also some tank destroyer variants of the Hago. The Type 5 Hohu used the hull to mount a 47mm anti-tank gun. Work on this project started in 1945, with it being unclear if a prototype was ever constructed. Next up is the Type 4 Hoto, which was actually built with one photo showing the prototype. Unfortunately, all information about this vehicle appears to be lost, but we know the main armament was a 120mm howitzer. Last but not least, we have the Soto, which is a modified Type 95 chassis with a 37mm Type 94 infantry anti-tank gun on a wheel carriage. I find this design to be rather cursed. While unknown to many, the Hako did actually see service even after the fall of Imperial Japan. In the early 1940s, Thailand bought around 50 of them. They were operated under the designation Type 83 and would see use up to 1954. What's quite remarkable is that one of these is still technically in service with the Thai army as it's kept as a show vehicle in fully operational order. Furthermore, the French army used the Type 95s after the war to reclaim control over their colonies, mainly French Indochina. Little information is known about them and a few photographs are out there. These photos show additional 10mm armor plates mounted to the turret. The vehicles were in operation until 1948. Furthermore, China also used some Hagos that it had captured during battle, with some of them being supplied by the Soviets. 
the end off with a bang, North Korea somehow also got their hands on some of them and they used them mainly for training. Whoa, okay, that was one hell of a ride. The Hako has a lot of history, way more than I thought. I saw day turn into night while writing this script, but I enjoyed it regardless. Some Hako survived the war, you can f find some in America, in Australia, Japan of course, and also at the Tank Museum in Bovington. All in all, the Hago is a pretty simple thing, but one which has a fascinating story, just like many other Japanese vehicles. As this video is already way too long, and speaking frankly, I'm quite tired, I will do a speed outro now. If you all enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe, like and share it, and if you feel like it, you can watch some more tanks and stuff videos linked in the playlist. I hope to see you all again in the next one. 